think we're in the recycling. That's okay, the city of Edmonton actually sorts out all of our trash for us, so it's all good. Actually, well, that's the mid, and it's a nasty one at that. Um, who are you and what are you doing in that trash can? Willis, just don't make eye contact, keep walking, and you can't harm us. Wait, harm you? I'm trying to help you. My name's Wally. Wait, wait, what's Wally? Well, what? Huh, uh, Wasteless? What kind of name is that? Wasteless as in I teach people like you, as well as other Edmontonians, about the waste they produce and how they can produce less of it. Well, Wasteless Wally, Edmonton doesn't actually have a trash issue as everything gets sorted out at the Edmonton landfill. Wait, you're saying that the Edmonton landfill filters everything and recycles what needs to be recycled? Yeah, in fact, Wally, that is what I said. And I actually learned that grade 3. Um, that's wrong on both accounts though, because the Edmonton landfill actually hasn't been in use for decades. It's actually being replaced systematically by the Edmonton Waste Management Center. Even if we don't have any city-owned landfills, we, I mean, all of our trash is still sorted by the Waste Management Center. Um, not really. I mean, they are sorted, but in a very superficial sense. So what happens to that pop bottle that you're in? That goes with other waste and either goes to the landfill or becomes garbage floss. Though you said there weren't any landfills. What's garbage floss? I'll show you. We're here to talk to Neil. He's a public education specialist for the Edmonton Waste Management Center. Y'all ready to go? Yeah. Stay. Right. I'll grab your coat and I'll see y'all later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Have fun. Learn a lot. Hey, hi, you must be Wendy. Hey, you. you must be Willis. Welcome to the Waste Map Center. Thanks so much. We've heard really good things about you from our friend Wally. Well, you know, Wally, he always makes me sound good. He sure does. Hey, do you want to come and have a look at the process? Yeah. Wally? Do. So, the Edmonton Lakes Management Center is only responsible for the waste for the city of Edmonton. Places like St. Albert, Sherwood Park, their waste doesn't come here. I see a lot of newspaper and flyers. Do those make it into the recycling? You know, from the garbage, no. But we still see that kind of material going into the garbage on a daily basis. So once it's in the garbage, that material will be going to the landfill. Well, that's weird. I thought Wally said the city doesn't actually have any more landfills. Well, that's true. Let's go have a look. So, Neil, I was wondering if you could help us break down the journey that trash goes through. Uh, through the Waste Management Center here. Absolutely. So in Edmonton, we have all of our recycling collected in the city. We collect our garbage in the city. That comes out to the Edmonton Waste Management Center. Recycling goes to the Materials Recovery Facility. The garbage comes in here, the integrated processing and transfer facility. The garbage goes through a remarkable journey. It goes through all kinds of different transformations. Organic waste gets turned into compost. Leftovers, it can be turned into something called biofuel. And some of it still has to be transferred to the landfill. Currently, we're getting about roughly 60, 50 to 60 percent of our waste is being diverted from the landfill, so that's really, really good. And we're diverting that amount, and then we still have to transfer a little bit to the landfill. Our main goal, though, is definitely to reach a 90 percent waste diversion. 90 percent waste diversion? That's really incredible. So what processes do waste go through here? All right, so from a garbage perspective, we turn all of the organic material into something called compost. So compost is something that we add to the soil to help your plants to grow. So it's a really great thing to do with our food waste and our yard waste. The leftovers, which is made up of all kinds of different things like packaging that we get from our uh, shipments. We have disposable food containers, liquids, our food. We have cereal bags, clothing items, this kind of stuff. That gets turned into something called garbage fluff, which then gets turned into methanol. And then in the future, we want to turn that into ethanol. Does biofuel contribute to greenhouse gases? You know, when we produce the biofuel, there's a little bit of CO2 that does come from the operation. But for the most part, this is a carbon capture process. Because methanol and ethanol in traditional sources is made from corn and natural gas. And when you make methanol and ethanol from corn and natural gas, it can produce up to an additional 60 to 80 percent more carbon. This is actually a carbon capture process into renewable sources of energy. Uh, speaking of greenhouse gases, what happens to the GHGs that are produced from Edmonton's former city landfill? Well, our landfill has been closed since 2009, but it still produces greenhouse gases, methane and carbon dioxide. The methane part of those greenhouse gases are trapped, and we turn that into electricity. Thank you so much, Neil, for breaking down everything that goes down here at the Edmonton Waste Management Center. My pleasure. Wendy, I'm so excited about recycling right now. Me too. We can restart this bag and figure out what we can send to the recycling center. 
Oh, even this styrofoam plate is recyclable. Awesome! Actually, wow. that's a myth. And it's a nasty one at that. I am never gonna get used to you popping up. Don't think you will. Wendy, I heard screaming. Is everything okay? Everything's okay. This is my partner, Willow. Hi. This is Wally. I'm Wally. Wasteless Wally. Oh, Wasteless Wally. I've heard a lot about you. Nice things, I assume? Yeah. Okay, well, anyways. Yeah, so many bush in a bubble here, but this thing, not recyclable. Uh, what do you mean? It has the little recyclable symbol on it with the arrows and a triangle? Right, but there's a difference between this being practically recyclable as well as technically recyclable. Huh? Yeah, so here, I'll explain. This thing here, it is technically recyclable. But recycling plants, they don't want to fork over the money to produce a technology that can recycle polystyrene, also known as styrofoam. And the reason why is because no one wants to buy the product that comes out of this being recycled. And so, without any financial incentives, no recycling plants want to recycle this. And so, let's look at this in a different perspective. We're going to use the example of California when it was under the governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger was elected governor of California. His campaign had many environmental goals. One was, he wanted to recycle all polystyrene. However, the market for recycled polystyrene was nearly non-existent. And soon, Arnold was out of office, and Jerry Brown, his successor, had to deal with the styrofoam problem. The recycled material was not selling, and it was costing a lot of money to keep the program. Jerry stopped recycling styrofoam, and the styrofoam that was in its recycled form was put into landfills. I don't understand. So styrofoam is scientifically recyclable, but the processing plants don't do it because the cost is too high? Exactly. So why do they bother putting recycling symbols on these products at all if they wind up in the landfill? It's a marketing strategy called greenwashing. Greenwashing? Yeah, greenwashing is an organization to intentionally disseminate misinformation to try and trick the public into thinking that their products are environmentally friendly when they're not. They try and use consumers' willingness to help the environment in order to make them buy their greenwash products, often at a premium. Hmm, I don't really think that's true. Well, I'll show you then. Y'all wanna go? Should we go? Yeah. Okay. You coming? No, that's okay. I think I'll start the rest of this trash here. Okay. At least you're helping the environment. Let's go, folks. Remember, it's trash can, not trash cannot. Hey folks, so, quick challenge for you two. Go in there, 15 minutes, find as many green products as you can, keep the receipts, we're going to be returning them later on. After all this time, you've been telling us that we need to use sustainable products, and now you want us to use disposable plastic <laughs> Don't underestimate me. Now, go. Have fun. Uh, I was just finishing sorting. Yeah. How did the uh, shopping trip go? Actually, it looks pretty successful. It was really good. You have a whole bunch of products that are 100% natural. Um, actually, that's a myth. And it's a nasty one at that. Did you know that in Canada, there's actually no regulations against labeling products as 100% natural or non-toxic? Wait, what? Yeah, so products like these, even though they say they're 100% natural, can contain anywhere from 30 to 60% petroleum. And products that are non-toxic can actually contain various toxic chemicals. Like, take for example, Dawn's antibacterial dishwashing soap. Wait, I don't understand. What's wrong with Dawn? They donate one dollar for every product to wildlife. That's what they want you to believe. Are you saying that Dawn doesn't actually donate to wildlife? Well, they do, but they also do a lot of things that are very bad for the environment, including containing a chemical called triclosan in the soap. Hold up, what's triclosan? Triclosan makes this soap antibacterial but it's very toxic to aquatic animals according to Environment at Canada. Mm, I don't see triclosan or whatever on this ingredients list. That's because the ingredient list for this is not regulated by the government, so they don't have to tell you what it's made out of. The only way you could get the ingredients for this is if your doctor calls up Don and asks him for it because they want to see if you're allergic to any ingredients in there. How is any of this legal? <clears throat> It's legal because the law is a lot slower than research. So by the time the law catches up and says, okay, we're going to outlaw triclosan. 
Dons have kind of come up with a few other chemicals that do the exact same things and are legal. Oh my gosh, like how can we prevent this? I know. What we have to do is one, never ever trust a label. Always do your own research. And second of all, take a stand against greenwashing. It's wrong and it's forcing companies to lie to you. Molly, I think you're right. I just did a Google search and I found a bunch of green products that actually reduce our carbon footprint. If we replace the appliances in here, then we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, aka saving the planet. That's a myth, and it's a nasty one at that. Here's why. You take an appliance, it doesn't matter if it's new, and it's green, or it's regular, that thing is still going to have a carbon footprint throughout its life. But 50% of that carbon footprint is, man is from manufacturing the product in the first place. So when you buy all these new appliances, you're increasing the carbon footprint unnecessarily. My advice, keep your appliances. When they break, buy new ones. But don't just buy new ones because you think you're going to be helping the environment. Ugh, I just, I feel like whenever I think I'm making a sustainable decision, I'm not. Everything is so hard. I feel the same, Wendy. I wonder what our next moves are to help the environment then. Our next moves? Our next move is to look at waste as a social issue and also to change each and every one of us in our perspectives and also consumers' perspectives on how we view the environment. There's something you need to see. Let's go, come on. Come on. Okay, let's do this. Wally, what are we doing back on campus? Well, y'all are university students, right? Yeah. Right, well, society has placed the future of this planet in the hands of the next generation. All of us. And we are in an institute of higher education where we're learning how to make society a better place. However, our actions and our attitudes do not totally reflect those intentions. I just am confused because all of the myths that we debunked today exist on the corporate level. How can we, as university students, change the decisions of billion dollar corporations? It's because waste is not an environmental issue as much as it is a social issue. It comes down to how consumers perceive products and the waste they produce. Corporations have spent billions of dollars to change our perception that disposable products are okay. Even 50 years ago, it would be unheard of to throw away containers like mason jars. Consumers would repurpose them. When plastics came to the market, corporations learned it was cheaper to put products in plastic containers rather than alternatives like glass. They saved money and advertised the convenience of disposable products to consumers. In the 1950s, when many companies changed their product lines to be disposable, litter started to become a problem. Notably, in 1953, Vermont banned disposable containers. In response, corporations came together to sponsor public service announcements to shift the blame to the consumers, coining the term litterbug. Waste is a social issue because we perceive our habits of make, use, dispose as acceptable, when in reality, these are corporate-made habits that have only existed in the past 60 or so years. That's our throwaway culture. Throwaway culture and greenwashing is something so heavily ingrained in our society that we do not even realize that we have been socialized into this mindset. We cannot wait for corporations to make changes because change starts at the individual level. But change occurs by collective action. Unless consumers demand a change, corporations won't act differently. And if corporations don't act differently, our class resources will be drained within the century and global warming will continue. The future of our species and the planet is at risk. I think I understand. I'm the president of the student group on campus, and from now on, all of our barbecues are going to be zero waste. And if that goes well, I should get student group services to mandate that all student groups do the same. Awesome. And I've actually noticed that a lot of students buy disposable water bottles when they're in a rush. What if the group of friends and I started a reusable water bottle service where people donate their water bottles to us, we wash them, and then they can use them, people can use them whenever. And if that's successful, we can move on to Tupperware. That's a really good idea, and I know that I have at least 200 followers on my blog, so if I research about green products, which ones are fake, which ones are real, and then I'll blog about what I've learned, that's at least 200 more people that can learn about sustainability and maybe make sustainable acts. <laughs> like how far you all have gone. So sorry. <laughs> oh. We call on all university and Alberta students to make one mindful change in reducing their weights and to teach at least one other individual to make a meaningful impact in their own lives.